Okay, so hello everyone. I'm Alessandro and I'm a research and development scientist at Planting Space and I'm here with Niklas. Uh, he teaches uh, functional programming languages in Julia at the Czech Technical University. And we're presenting <laughs> MethodEar.jl, which is a package for performant graphs in pure Julia. And you may be wondering, oh, first of all, I have to say huge thanks to Philip Zucker here, which sparked the idea originally by sending over the egg paper back in 2021. And yeah, thank you, Phil, for the great idea. It evolved into a cool project. So you may be wondering, <laughs> why Julia? So <laughs> all the research is done in programming languages is done in Rust, Haskell, OCaml, and functional languages. And so why does uh, the Julia programming language matter? So uh, if you take a look at a blog post from the original authors of Julia, um, they wanted a language that is very simple to learn and yet keeps like hackers happy. Uh, so it's a meta language, it's compiled, and it's interactive. So uh, this is quite interesting for programming language research. Even though it doesn't have all the features of a functional programming language, it's quite cool to experiment and do very crazy things with e-graphs and compilation stuff. So uh, it's an ambitious project, and it's kind of meant to solve the issue of having to use multiple programming languages, one that is fast and one that is easy. I think about TensorFlow, for example. C core in C++ and Surface in Python. This is known as the two language problem. And Julia is kind of designed to uh, be as fast as C and Rust and C++ compiled via LLVM, uh, have the generality and friendliness of Python, and then have statistical power of R, linear algebra features as MATLAB, be dynamic as Ruby, and most importantly for us, be a meta language. So have meta programming features like uh, scheme macros, quote and unquote mechanisms, and racket stuff. That's how you build like in lots of compilers are built. And then there is a crazy type system that is a bit different from functional programming languages, but it's really cool and you can do uh, very interesting stuff with it, even though it doesn't have arrow types, it has parametric types and lots of other cool features that we're gonna see later. So Julia is meant to solve this two language problem where you need to have like specialized teams of people working on different programming languages into a single system. Uh, into you know multiple modules made in different programming languages, you can make everything in Julia. And uh, why eGraphs then in Julia? Here we have uh, uh, an equation for an ocean model, oceanographic model, that um, yeah has gradients. So we want to run gradients on GPUs efficiently. And how does the Julia code look then? Uh, Julia is designed to look pretty much like the equations on paper. So you can use uh, yeah symbols that look like the equations on paper. And so if we reason about the equations on paper via equational reasoning, why not reason with equational reasoning in Julia code? And this snippet is pretty cool because it can run on CPU and GPUs at the same time. And let's not focus too much about this snippet of code, but just see how similar it is to the equation at the top. And also why eGraphs in Julia? It's very composable as a language and there's state-of-the-art scientific machine learning uh, ecosystem, <coughs> which is called SciML. And we have state-of-the-art differential equation solver, amazing automatic differentiation, and you can plug these things together. They're made to be plugged together. And where's, where does equality saturation fit in this context? So uh, we can build a ordinary differential equation problem and differential equation problems symbolically, starting from an expression from an equation. And there is a library called Symbolics, which does all the cool symbolic stuff. And then uh, you generate a step function for numerical evaluation later, which is the one at the bottom, where you actually solve the ODE problem. And where do you want to insert equality saturation in between the symbolic construction and the numerical evaluation of these kind of scientific machine learning pro pro problems? Programs, <laughs> yeah. And uh, why? Because you can optimize those, program, those programs by using the equations that define your theory on paper. So if you can write like uh, high level compiler optimizations uh, that really fit inside of the program without having to exit the same host programming language. And so let's jump to the package. So what is metatheory.jl? Metatheory.jl is a Julia package for uh, general purpose metaprogramming and gives a bit of structure to the already existing features because Julia doesn't really have a pattern matcher. We use multiple dispatch. And so we have a DSL for pattern matching, which is quite inspired from OCaml and those functional languages. And it's compiled via source-to-source -source transformation, we're gonna see it later. Thus, it's very minimal and extensible. It's just a macro. It's a expanding macros. 
And it's integrated with an expressive type system, so we can, uh, can go back and forth with all the cool Julia type system features. Then we have a classical rewriting engine where rules are functions, are callable objects, so they're struct, and they hold the pattern matching functions, and thus you can combine them with higher, higher order functions with functional combinators, like fixed points or chains of the rewrite rules, and it's backward compatible, backwards compatible with symbolics.jl that is built on top of these combinators. And then we also have the eGraph engine, which plays together with all these other features here. It's dynamically typed, so it, mean, it means that you, you're not fixed to a single language of expressions. You can use whatever Julia object that is shaped as a tree. It's interactive, so you can stop saturation, you can jump inside, you can debug it, you can visualize it. And it performs as close to Rust. We managed to optimize it a, lo a lot. And the cool thing is that you can write Julia inside of your Julia program with just a macro. You so you can run equality saturation uh, inside of your program with just a macro and define your equality saturation workflow without leaving the Julia workflow of your repo. And it's quite extensible. I mean, it's, uh, the, um, the size is pretty small. So let's look at a workflow. Uh, easiest thing, we load the package. <laughs> then we define a system of rules with the theory macro, which is just a vector of rewrite rules. But the macro expands the syntax into the actual pattern matching functions. And we have three kinds of rules. The first one is equational rule. We used to that. And the second one, uh, I like to call it the fat arrow rule. And uh, on the right-hand side of the fat arrows, you can, um, the right-hand side is evaluated as Julia code. So it's not a pattern. It's like a Julia closer. And this one is doing constant propagation because this type assertion is checking that you have an integer literal constant instead of, um, instead of your E-class. And it only matches if you have two integers in two different E-classes. And then it's summing them. And so it's doing constant propagation. And it's fairly like super easy to see and visualize. And the last one is just classical left to right, the rewrite rules. So um, yeah, you can also define the variables at the top. And uh, yeah, how do you make an e-graph? We have two type parameters. The first one is the kind of expression language that you want. It can be an abstract type. We're going to see later how and why this is useful. And then you have an analysis type. And you can dispatch on the analysis type to interchange whatever value you want to run the analysis, the e-graph analysis on. And then the cool thing about Julia is that we have the quote operator. This is pretty much, if anyone is familiar with scheme and racket, it's just the tick in scheme. And this one is not evaluated as, uh, as a program. It's just you know symbolic expression straight out in Julia. And uh, then you define the parameters. They're pretty much the same as egg, uh, though uh, we're planning to expand it a little bit. And then you call saturate. It's pretty easy. And then you can extract. You can extract by choosing the cost function there, and you can define your cost functions by using multiple dispatch. So uh, how do we achieve dynamic typing? Uh, I want to stop for a few seconds talking about term interface, because we spent a lot of time with the folks over at MIT to design an interface that is backwards compatible with symbolics and works in the whole Julia ecosystem so that we can rewrite with classical rewriting and e-graphs on any tree-like Julia object. And it's fairly simple, because you just have uh, something that is a uh, tree node or a leaf, and it's defined by the first function, is expert. And uh, then we also needed to differentiate function calls from other AST nodes. And uh, this is useful for making the Julia language itself compatible with the symbolic stuff. And then you had car and CDR, if you're used to Lisp, Lisp which is like head and children. And then you also have the same thing, but with the distinct, like you have to distinguish between uh, function calls and non-function call nodes. And yeah, this is what made us um, compatible with Julia and Symbolics at the same time. Well, the magic happens here. So how do you actually get stuff out of eGraphs? Because to get as fast as Rust, we had to pack everything into byte buffers. So we're just treating bytes. We're not treating actual objects. So we have defined this function uh, in the term interface that you can use to dispatch on the, your type or your language type T to take expressions out of efficient byte buffers from any context, classical rewriting, e-graphs, et cetera. And so you have to define a method for make term to say how do you get expressions actually out of the e-graph, and that's how we achieve dynamic typing. And we achieve it via a language feature that is called dynamic multiple dispatch. And yeah, so we can stop for a second there. And I wanted to show this very cool example from Mosè Giordano. And uh, it's rock, paper, scissors in something like nine lines of code. 
And it pretty much shows the cool stuff about the Julia type system. We have abstract types, we have structs, they can hold fields, we have explicit explicit subtyping, then we have parametric types, because the type type itself is parametric. And uh, we have multiple dispatch. It means that if you have a function, you can define different methods with different types, pretty much as you do in Java, but this one is special because it can also happen at runtime. That's how Julia is dynamically typed. So if you write the Julia program and the compiler can infer the types of everything, then it's purely compiled and it just runs. But if you cannot infer something and it's duct typed, you don't add the type of variables, it stops, inserts a breakpoint at runtime and says, hey, what is, what is the type of these things? And then uh, compiles the missing methods or throws an error and resumes the operations. So Julia is very fast the second time you run it. The first time you run your program, it has to stop and then compile again. But the second time you run it, it's actually very fast. And this is how we achieve interactivity without losing the performance of Rust. And let's take a super quick look at how you define patterns, and it's very straightforward. You have pattern variables, you use a tilde. You have segment variables, which are not yet compatible with eGraphs, but they can match zero or more arguments in a node, and you can just use the ellipses or double tilde. And the cool thing with multiple dispatch is predicates. So um, we support predicates, and they can be functions or types. So if you have a predicate function, you can use multiple dispatch to distinguish the context of where you're rewriting. So if you dispatch against the type of a simple expression, it means that you're in classical rewriting. You're dispatching against a tree, and your predicate can be true or false, depending on your term object. But in the context of eGraphs, you have e-classes, and so you have to distinguish, and you have to dispatch against your context, which can be an e-graph and an e-class. So your predicate foo may check if your term holds, some property holds, or if you have something inside of your e-class. So it's very extensible in this sense because you can use predicates you know, for type assertions, and also um, for type T is fairly straightforward. I mean, you just match it if your object in classical rewriting has type T, or if it has in e-graphs, if your e-class has a constant of type T inside of it. And we're also working on multi-patterns, which are very simple, so the end pattern will match only if the e-class matches the both, both patterns, and the or pattern will match only if uh, at least one of those two matches in the e-class. And let's talk about how do we get it to go as fast as Rust. So Niklas here helped me out with lots of benchmarks. And uh, uh, with the yellow bean, you can see how it compares to the old version. And the blue bean, how the new like, method theory free compares to egg uh, using the generic symbol language. And the benchmarks are fairly like simple propositional logic, theorem proving, and math simplification benchmarks. We define it a bunch, and it's pretty extensible, so we can define more. And we're something around like 200 times faster uh, of the previous version. And we can see that we're pretty much reaching Egg's performance. And that's very cool. Thank you, Niklas, for all the benchmarks help. And also, we have a table here. You don't have to look at all the numbers. But this is automatically produced by benchmarks on GitHub runners. So every time you open a pull request to methotheory.gl, all the benchmarks are run automatically. And this table is produced. And it shows how it compares with the master branch and with egg. So that was a huge uh, <laughs> that was a huge thing for optimizing the whole thing and getting getting it, getting it run as fast as egg. And sometimes we're a little bit faster. Sometimes we're slower if we if you use custom languages in egg. And the method theory benchmarks we're just using the built-in Julia expression. So we're using the meta language type that is built into the language. But if you optimize your types, you probably can go even faster. So what do we solve? Why? Why this whole project? Uh, first of all, we don't have pattern matching construct like OCaml in France. We do have a library called ML style that is really cool, but we wanted something uh, that works with symbolics. And we solved the two language problem for equality saturation because you may have your core of rewriting and your application in the same language. We have performance close to Rust, and then you can directly rewrite your Julia programs and do crazy stuff at all the levels of abstraction that you have in Julia. We're, we managed to get faster with classical rewriting in symb than Symbolics.jl. 
And uh, once you have a meta language and equality saturation, what happens? You have meta programming, but you have equations. So it's structured meta programming. You have algebraic structures because you have equations that dictate them. And it, this really means that in scientific computing, as we saw in the first slides, if you have code that looks like complicated equations, you can then do some crazy compiler optimizations just by uh, defining some strategy for equality saturation and a uh, rule set with equational rules. And that's the whole idea of the applications. Let's talk about them. So we have a new one by Hector Peters that has contacted me and he managed to plug methodtheory.gl inside the Julia compiler itself and rewrite on the intermediate representation of the Julia compiler itself without leaving the same REPL session. He had to add a pass manager, so he forked the compiler, but uh, it's based on crane lift ideas and side effects are encoded and he's missing control flow and a bunch of things, but this is really cool. I mean, this can become something in the Julia compiler itself uh, written in Julia, and yeah, so you just pass, you have a macro, so you have some options, some rewrite rules, and whatever you want to optimize, and this is not done on the expression level, but on the intermediate representation level. And another application that we have is obviously symbolics.jl, where we want the domain-specific compiler optimizations, and we have a package called modelingtoolkit.jl, and uh, we can do high-level optimizers for differential equation solvers, as we already showed a few years ago. And the difference um, between the pattern matchers is that Symbolics uses a continuation passing style of runtime closures, while with methodtheory.gl, we are now fully source-to-source -source, um, transpiled. So it's just macro expansion. And yeah, in the cl context of classical rewriting, we managed to go something like four times faster. You can see on the left we have method theory, it takes like 150 nanoseconds, that's pretty fast. And symbolics take a little bit like three times more. And yeah, we're also aiming to kill all of the heap allocations for rewriting, so we were aiming for pretty fast uh, term rewriting in general. And then we have Niklas's application which is OptiFloat, which is Herbie in pure Julia that implement, implements a macro that optimizes floating point expressions the same way Herbie does, but without having to plug together uh, different programming languages like Rust and yeah, Rocket and everything. And you can straight up do it for your scientific code inside of the same program. And uh, it works on any expression supported by term interface. So Julia programs, symbolics, and whatever you want and it's planned to be a part of the scientific machine learning ecosystem. So, um, yeah, and the challenge is integrating actually methodtheory.gl in symbolics.gl completely, which is uh, ongoing. And we have another very cool application that is very connected to the talk that we saw before about the e hypergraphs. And uh, there's a very nice uh, ecosystem of packages based on category theory and also connected to the Topos Institute uh, called algebraicjulia.org, that's the website, and catlab.jl, which is kind of the core. They do rewriting for categories, um, and mm, you can do pretty much lot, lots of things with it. Databases, uh, you know, uh, dynamical systems, crazy stuff you can do with category theory. But they use this theory from the 80s called generalized algebraic theories, and it will really, really benefit from an implementation of e-hypergraphs because it's all symmetric monodal categories that we saw before. And that's an exciting you know, uh, future application that we would like to work on. And it will really benefit from efficient and performant e-graphs in Julia. So uh, some other future work, uh, we're planning to have associative commutative e-matching research to see how we can actually optimize the e-matching procedure and the data structure to support uh, better ways of um, reducing the impact of explosions, um, yeah, combinatorial explosion. And there's some, some work has started that. And then uh, we're also working at the same time, uh, some Niklas colleagues at the Czech University are working on proof production. And it's gonna turn the Julia language and actually something similar to Twi that Phil mentioned this morning, uh, because we're going to have a metaprogramming theorem prover, and it means that you just open the REPL, open meta theory, and you have a full theorem prover that works on Julia expressions. 
we're also putting a lot of effort into improving schedulers because they're important for like through improving tasks and there's some work being done there too and then yeah we would like to be feature complete so we would like to experiment implementations and extensions uh, reusing components around to implement all the cool uh, a acyclic e graphs, colored e graphs, slotted e graphs, etc. Um, it's open source, it's public domain, and it's maintained in our free time, even though it's supported by my company. So we're currently accepting sponsorship and donations. And um, yeah, it's supported by my, my super cool company, Planting Space. And we offer, we're hiring, we're looking for an engineer that you know, uh, uh, we're looking for compiler hackers, pretty much, with multidisciplinary skill sets. And we are hiring fully remote. We go really often in fun locations. We're not working on methatheory.jl for now. You know, I'm always talking about it, <laughs> though, <laughs> in the company. But s very interesting and similar challenges. That's why I started there. And we, although even though we work in Julia, we value experience in category theory, uh, information theory, dynamical systems, and languages like Rust, OCaml, Clojure, C++, and Haskell. And lots of algorithms from programming language theory. And I think uh, they wanted to show me, I want to show it, very cool short. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the link, if you're interested. And thank you. Time for questions. Thanks for the talk. Yeah, we definitely have time for a few questions. Uh, I'll start us off here. Uh, one of the cool things uh, about the Julia, about projects in Julia, and it sounds like you're using this and the applications are using this, is sort of uh, runtime code generation. Uh, are you using this inside of Meta Theory itself, for for example, like for doing e matching or something? Uh, we're, I, I had some ideas of bootstrapping. But it uh, it's not the case right now. I'm planning to use um, to use these for um, uh, pretty much use the pattern matching features uh, to then define the whole syntax layer and kind of bootstrap it. And the runtime generated functions we're thinking about it in case we have to generate rewrite rules in problems like synthesis. So we have generated functions in Julia, but we still haven't experimented yet with it. So that's kind of the trade-off between CPS of runtime closures and then having super fast macro expansions there. So yeah, it's it's a good question there. Let's thank okay. Alessandro one more time. Thank you.